But all of the speakers at the conference, all of the human speakers, provided compelling evidence that feeding an extruded, highly refined carbohydrate rich diet is bad for pets. It's bad for people and we are omnivores. If you look at our dentition, we've got grinding teeth and we don't have especially big canine teeth. You know, us and the pigs, we're cosmopolitan in our tastes. We can do things. The cat is an obligate carnivore and the dog's pretty close. And, and so if this is bad for us, if all of the people in the Charles Perkins Centre say that, and they all talk about the marketing of Big Soda and Big Pharma and, 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 and all of those things, it's all just telling us that we're on the thing. So I wanted to sort of start with some facts and remember this is the talk I gave at the time. People spent about five times as much money on pet food as they do on veterinary care. That's really an important driver, you know, for the duration of a cat's life. Now, I don't know, in, it's different in the UK because you've got pet insurance and people have a different level of commitment to animals. But the driver, people spend much more money on food than they do on veterinary care. So if you add up how much money they spend every year, that's, that's a big economic driver for pet owners. And pet food manufacturers have an obligation to look after their shareholders. There's nothing in their charter that says they should be interested in animal welfare. <laughs> you like my animated GIF files? I searched the internet for hours to find them. You can have them all for all of your talks. He's really got the shits. But they, they, if you buy shares in Colgate Palmolive, they own hills and you want to get a dividend every year. That's the driver. Who makes pet food? Now, this has changed since I de did that, and Pete's more up to date than me, but traditionally it used to be Nestle that gobbled up Purina. Purina was the first company that developed kibble because there was a biscuit company in America and they couldn't sell all the biscuits, so they started selling it as dog food. And then they, they reverse engineered it. They worked out a way to make biscuit into a better diet by adding fat and protein and to make it better. But that's how it all started. So Nestle got a Swiss company, a Swiss company that is generally regarded as being a very bad company about what it does to developing third world nations and how it sells things. It's not like, I eat a lot of Nestle chocolate, okay? But they're not really a highly ethical company in terms of what they do in terms of philanthropic activities. Mars, that used to own Waltham's, it's sort of almost disappeared. They bought Royal Cannon because I think they thought the food was a bit better. In Australia, they own Uncle Ben's, which is an Australian subsidiary that makes most of the supermarket brands using Australian produce and wheat and beef and things like that. And then we've got Colbert Palmolive that own Hills. Now, isn't it interesting? Here we've got pet food companies. We've got one chocolate maker, another chocolate maker, and people that make toothpaste. <laughs> like, the skill that they bring is marketing, okay? And, you know, the, all of these foods, chocolate's really nice, but you don't need it. And that's like this. So the marketing is outstanding, and they've worked out the way to get vets and pet stores and even universities to do their marketing for them. And so DARF makes an, an important contribution here because they really have, you know, got us to go to the dark side. Now I work at this practice, this is Double Bay Vet Clinic and luckily it's not in Australia so none of you are likely to go there and it's a very typical clinic in a very posh part of Sydney. It's a, like a three vet practice with an emphasis on medicine rather than on surgery and this is the waiting room. This is one side and I would suggest to you that 90% of veterinary practices in Australia are just like that. It isn't like Where's the thing about saying how to prevent tick paralysis? Or um, how often your cat should be vaccinated? I mean, I don't, when you go to the doctor, do you go there and find there's a shelf of chocolate for you to eat in the waiting room while you wait to see the GP? It doesn't, that doesn't happen in Australia, I don't know, here. Here's the other side of the room, okay, where the pet treats and things are. Now, I was gonna try, do you have greenies here? Do you know when greenies came out, like it was a, supposed to be a dental chew that abrades the tartar off dogs' teeth? The first design model inadvertently was a perfectly designed esophageal foreign body <laughs> because many dogs d didn't chew it because they thought, oh, you know, if you give a dog a chicken wing, which is sort of one of my favourite things to give dogs, they go crunch, crunch, swallow. So they can eat a chicken wing 
like a medium-sized dog in one go. So the, this was designed for dogs to chew, but they'd gulp it down. And these serrations caused a lot of friction and it would swell as soon as it hit the esophagus. So it was like somebody purposely designed the most effective esophageal foreign body ever invented. <laughs> and Michael Lee got a really high impact paper in JAVMA talking about how to remove them with an endoscope and then they changed the size of it to stop that thing happening. That's the, what happens when you try to invent something that is like a, a gentle bone and ask people to pay five times as much of buying the right one from the butcher. Now, two more things. Can you see down here it says Vets Best Rewards? And it's got a picture of a professor from the University of Sydney. And now I've deliberately half hidden his face. And I won't mention his name because you're recording this. And I'm already in a shitload of trouble with everybody in the University of Sydney about almost everything. <laughs> I've been excommunicated once and I'm sure the second coming is, is about to happen. But why do we have the face of a professor from the University of Sydney on a dog treat thing? Does he get paid for it? Does the university get paid for it? How much credibility can anybody have when their photo is on that? I mean, I find it truly extraordinary. Now, the other thing is, do you know what is in, do you have these liver treats? Okay, it's lyophilized liver, it's freeze-dried liver in slices. And if you weigh it and put it on an analytic scale, it's more expensive than caviar. <laughs> okay? Well, close. So, you know, Martin, just I'm my mother. Caviar easier. <laughs> never let facts interfere with a good story was the motto <laughs> my mother told me when I was young. It is like, like you pay $8. If you went to the butcher, they would give you some liver. You could slice it up and it would be fresh. But because, and every vet in Sydney has this, and at the end of a consult, they give the dog a liver treat and make a shitload of money for this particular company. So I was, just, I was going to do a little experiment, okay? This is um, bottled water, correct? How much do you think this cost? How much? Okay. It's more expensive than petrol. Now, for Martin, who really embraces evidence-based medicine, it's been shown in Australia that in a taste test where they've got all of these bottled waters and they've compared them to what we call Sydney water, which is what comes out of the tap, and if you all put them in the fridge and pour them into a glass jar, Sydney water wins the taste test. <laughs> and how much does it cost? Nothing. Nothing. Now, why have you people that embrace natural feeding bought 30 bottles for five quid each of this stuff. Isn't it extraordinary in the power of marketing? When I was a kid growing up, you know, dressed, I didn't, I was a bit like that. <laughs> Long hair. <laughs> anyway, back to Forrest Gump. We had a bubbler. You press the button, put your mouth, you drink. They were everywhere. If you didn't think, that if your person before looked a bit dirty, you'd use your elbow and clean it a little bit first before you'd have a suck on it. But like, why? It's just the same. Liver treats, bottled water. It's a type of insanity. It's more expensive than petrol. Do all of you complain when you go to the car and you put petrol in? Oh, shit, it's expensive. 20 quid for one litre. <laughs> now, these are assorted things. This is really, I think, the crux of the matter. And I think all of you know it. But I think it's really important we stand on a pedestal and we tell the whole world. This means almost every university on the planet is in bed with multinational pet food manufacturers, okay? Now, you can't read all of those things. I've got some from the UK. Let me talk about some things in Australia. The University of Queensland School of Veterinary Science has stepped up its focus on animal nutrition through a strong partnership with premium pet food maker Hills. Doesn't it sound like it's the pastor giving a sermon on Sunday? It's really like bang it a little bit harder, drive it in, you know, premium food. It's never happened before. Two academic positions at the University of Queensland. Is it surprising that when they polled people that come out of the unis in Australia that 90% of the people recommend a prescription diet with every consult? So, it just, so you think, oh, it's just the Queenslanders. Like, they're a bit funny. Could, could that be it? But look, University of Melbourne, and they always have a picture of the smiling dean. Okay, and so here's Carolyn Mansfield. She's really good. She's a really good clinician. She trains with Boy Jones way back. 
but her salary gets paid for by Hills and she's the head of medicine at the University of Melbourne and I think that's really good. There has to be a separation of powers. We have it in our society. Politician and law are different. You can't get money from these people and have the head of medicine that's specifically interested in gastroenterology and pancreatitis being paid money from a pet food manufacturer. You just can't do it. Like, every time she gives a lecture, she needs to give a disclosure. I need to tell all of you guys that my salary gets paid for by Hills. It doesn't happen. It's not right. And it happens everywhere. It happens at Davis. Look at this. We, we, this came out as an email. But I had a mental, I, there's a lot of folks in Australia about mental health and veterinarians. A lot of suicide, a lot of depression, a lot of issues. So they have these things for students. And who's bringing it to you? Hills. Everywhere, I don't know. The biggest trouble is the evidence base in relation to feeding companion animals is incredibly biased. And that's because it's really expensive to do nutrition research, especially the type that goes for the arc of a life of an animal. What's been very well studied is how to grow a kitten into a cat. We know exactly how much vitamin D they need. We know the calcium to phosphorus ratio that they need. We can grow things really well just like we can grow poultry really well or pigs really well. But we actually don't know the requirements for an adult cat. Nobody has worked out how much vitamin D an adult cat needs. All of the cat foods have got too much vitamin D. Probably it doesn't do any harm, but maybe it does, because they've only done the research in kittens. If you want to study the lifetime impact of feeding a particular diet, and it's been done, it costs about a million bucks. So there's a really good study by Richard Kearney, known to, by his friends as Dick Kearney, who used to work for Purina. And he did a lifetime study in golden retrievers. He had two runs, one on the left, one on the right. And he did a very simple thing. They were all fed Purina food. Can't remember what it was. One group was fed to be lean, and they used portion control. And the other group was fed to be fat. And they looked how long they lived. And the thin group lived two years longer than the fat group. And the fat group was euthanized for osteoarthritis or cancer. That was a $1 million experiment because the dogs all needed to be walked. They all needed to be fed. They all needed veterinary attention. They were specifically, the real focus on the study was the impact of diet on hip dysplasia and adiposity. But the interesting thing for me was how long the dogs lived. Like we know in most species, if you keep things lean, they live longer. And the reasons why are complex. And the one thing I can tell you is everything is far more complicated than we can ever understand. Nutrition, genomics, how it all mixes up together. We, can, we simplify everything so in our working brain we can make decisions about sick animals. But everything is really complicated. But it's just that Massey University is the most logical place to do research, particularly about feline nutrition, because they've got a cat colony. And it's a self-funding cat colony. So they're really clever. It's not part of the vet faculty, although the vet faculty school has a, 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 an input into it. It's run by a guy. And they've got detailed records on all of the cats there. They know when they were born, what blood groups, what age they are, when they're desexed. And they use them for feeding trials, palatability trials, for different pet food companies in New Zealand. So they'll try this canned food versus that canned food, and this dry food versus that canned. That colony is just dying for you to go to them and saying, OK, let's do a project with you, Nick Cave. Instead of you comparing one type of dry food with a lot of beef protein with another one that has lamb, because somebody will pay you to do it, feed your food that you make up and follow them for their life and measure haematology, biochemistry, x-rays, physical examination, how long they live for, what they die of, study their microbiome, it would be a fantastic research project. If you try to do it any other way, how could, it's not so easy to do in practice. But interestingly, I've got a friend, a very we crazy, have what? We have time. <laughs> They'll never let you do it. I've got a, a very crazy friend called Kim Kendall, who owns a cat practice. And Kim is an eccentric lady. Her hair is like tortoiseshell. She's my age but she looks like a torty cat, so she's sort of out there. And we're friends, we've provider, the Charles Perkins Centre and the Faculty of Medicine. And I was on the steering committee, and I'm a cunning bugger, because I'm really good at fine detail work, not as good as Paul Canfield, but, but I can when there's a, a reason. And I set up the whole thing, 
Oh, sorry, this is the Zubiquity Conference. People, um, you're supposed to laugh at this stage. I, I, I should have put a little smiley down the bottom to give people, okay. So here, here are some of um, David Rabenheimer talking about an ecological evolutionary perspective. He's an interesting man. He started off by studying energetics of locusts. So he started off in what drove locusts to eat food. And from, from that beginning, he got interested in all aspects of nutrition. So that's sort of a good example how somebody like Martin, who was, did a PhD in auditory neurophysiology, could use that in a different way. Um, then Ian Catterson is the head of endocrinology of Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, which is sort of the poshest hospital in Sydney, talking about is there a global epidemic of obesity and diabetes. Then Louise Bauer from the Kids Hospital talked about preventing adiposity, and she runs a clinic for kids that are really fat and studying them. Linda Fleeman, who's a really good key opinion leader in Australia, she somebody did a PhD with Jackie Round about diabetes in dogs. She runs a diabetes clinic in Melbourne. So her whole area of expertise is treating diabetics. So she's talking about diabetes in, in dogs. And Catherine, just trying to go through it, Krista Nadler, who will come up later, talks about periodontal disease and its relationship to diet. So we're picking, or I picked these people very deliberately because I'm interested in in comparative disease and the things that inform using people as a model about how we should look after animals. So keep on going. Bruce Neal is a cardiologist that became really interested in policy. His big thing is identifying how much salt is present in food in Australia and labelling it. Because he thinks he can save more coronary vascular lives by getting people to eat a whole lot less salt than he ever can by working in the cath lab doing angioplasties. And his talk was with Bridget Kelly, who was um, a girl that did a PhD about the effect of marketing on all of it, was the impact of big food and big soda on human food intake. Timothy Gill talked about what is a very new concept at the moment, the, the new concept of feeding, and it's a Scandinavian idea. You know, in the old days you say, well, you know, the protein concentration's 30% and the carbohydrate's 30% and the fat's something or other, and then there are They've abandoned that approach. When they look at a diet to look whether it's complete, they look whether you can identify the food constituents. So if you have dinner and you can say it's a sirloin steak with some um, potatoes and some beans, that's a really good diet because you can actually identify what the different foods are, right? Whereas if you go to Smith's Crisps, you don't really know what's inside them. If you get bread, you really don't. So highly refined carbohydrate diets or any food where you can't identify the food constituents is perceived to be bad. And they've thrown away the concept of looking at fat and protein, carbohydrate, much simpler criteria, something people can use in developing and nations and, and, and things like that. And so on. So the whole meeting was really set up to show people that feeding commercial dry food if it was available for people, would be really dumb, okay? And then I gave the talk that I'm about to give, and because I'm too lazy to change it, this is essentially the same talk I gave there, and then I've tagged some other stuff in the end about politics and shit stirring and reading Malcolm Gladwell. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry, this, like, this is all I have to offer, be, because <laughs> can't, two hours isn't enough to teach you how to, do pyrosequencing to understand the microbiome. One thing I should just mention, one of the talks was unforeseen dietary dangers. And I just thought I'd just step off and talk about them because I'm keen to tell you some of the things that happen in Australia that might not have reached the press here. Some of them you'll know about, some you won't. Have you heard about Fanconi's like syndrome from Chinese jerky treats? Did that happen in England? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, big thing in Australia. There, like the the, pers the two people who had the most to do with it was Sue, Sue Foster and Mary Thompson. And Sue Foster trained with me. She's a feline specialist, went in academia, now does a whole range of other things, is interested in welfare and ecology, a ho whole lot of different things. But for some reason, because a lot of her, her primary income stream comes from working for a clinical pathology company where she reports on cases and gives advice about how to treat them. And she saw these hundreds of cases 
and Mary at that stage was the University of Queensland. So if you know about that story, like we knew which product, it was called Kmar Chinese Jerky Treats, we knew they were made in China, we knew all of the batch numbers, we knew the beef jerky treats were fine. And there was legal things, people were th threatened and sued and they did a really good job using the tipping point principle to effect a change. And not only did they eventually get it off the supermarket shelves, but the company went bankrupt and no longer exists in Australia. Serves them right. Because they should have immediately, when it was uh, alerted, they should have withdrawn the product themselves. And Woolworths that sold it should have done the same thing. And many dogs got unnecessary toxicity. So you know about that one. Now you all know that grapes can, can if you give too many grapes, also those dogs can get, can, they can get renal failure. Like that's crazy. We need some good research there. But it's just like, that's, this is all new to me because when, when I was at vet school, nobody told me I've been feeding dog cells harness at picnics my whole life. They seem to like them. There's a threshold and there might be, nobody knows the toxic principle. You know about lilies and cats? Same deal, really important. Um, International Cat Care has done a wonderful job about, you know, trying to prevent that. You all know about onions and oxidative damage? In Australia, you see, we have the sun. I know that's a novel concept. But we cook a lot outside and have barbecues and it's very common to have a whole lot of onions on the barbecue and all the ones that people don't finish at the end because they're worried about having bad breath. Then the dogs eat and they all get haemolytic anemia. Um, the melamine story, it's well worth reading the book by Marianne Nestle about what that happened because you'll never understand the whole ethos and philosophy of multinational pet food companies, unless you understand how melamine got into the food chain, that all of the pet food companies, including Hills, which is sort of like the key opinion leader in that particular group, are so stingy and so profit mo motivated that they would source gluten, not from North America, where they make really good quality gluten from all of their corn and wheat, but they would buy it in China because it's three shekels cheaper okay, or slotties if you're Polish, or whatever else that, I'm Polish. Like. Anyway, and they would adulterate it with stuff that artificially increases its nitrogen concentration. Now that s problem hardly touched Australia, it was very well investigated in America. Vets did a really good job getting on top of it really quickly. The pet food companies really dragged their feet doing anything about it. There was Nile and procrastination and prevarication and they didn't react quickly and they should have reacted really quickly and eventually it was sorted. But people didn't learn the lesson and then exactly the same thing happened in human infant formula for milk in China. And the Chinese had a really good solution. They executed the people that sold the gluten. <laughs> they killed them. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm being, it's not like, they, they, that was not good for their export <laughs> philosophy and they fixed that problem. But if you need to read the book because otherwise you won't, if, if, if you think the stuff that comes in the plastic bag is like manna from heaven and it is by the people, they say we have the best scientists in the world and we've got the best, every gastroenterologist in North America says these diets are the best and Nick Cave swears by it, he eats hills instead of cereal in the morning <laughs> because Grant Guilford told him to, okay, then, 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 it's really bad. So I think that, and, and two more, because as I said, I, I, I want to entertain you. These things I think are really stimulating. Have you heard about the irradiation pet food story in Australia? There's a company called Origin, I might be slightly mispronouncing that, in Canada. And they make, make a premium, a so-called high protein premium food that, that has a I don't know their animal source, whether it's cow or deer or something, but Australia has very tight biosecurity. And really, I think all of you underdeveloped countries like the UK, where you've got tuberculosis rampant through the whole community and spongiform encephalopathy, we want to keep those diseases right out. We've got good food security. New Zealand's even worse. So they got this origin food and they gamma irradiated it. They wanted to kill any infectious agents in it. And gamma radiation is used for a whole variety of food sources. A lot of apples coming to the country are gamma irradiated, and so forth and so on. And it took a while for the people to work it out. Georgina Child did most of her work, an Australian neurologist that was um, trained in Davis. It just did a detective story. But 
this thing had happened before, and in fact, Boyd Jones, give the Kiwis a good plug, had found this in a research colony and written about it 10 years earlier. But it was just this funny diet they were radiating and he wrote it up while he was in Dublin. But it occurred in Sydney and the, somehow the irradiation of the food produces, who knows, free radicals or something that causes a demyelinating myelopathy. And the cats were paralysed and most of them got better over about a year. But that's a very unforeseen complication. And it shows that even that company, I believe, is sort of has the best intentions and they try to put more protein in. I don't like it still comes in a plastic bag, so it doesn't work for me. But it's such an interesting story. The last one is even more secure, more obscure. Has anybody heard of endoscopine? It's an interesting toxicant. At least you're all awake. <laughs> I know it's not. Australia has more feral animals than any other place on the planet. We've got more feral, we've got more brumbies in Australia than they have mustangs in America. We have more feral goats in Australia than exist in Europe. And we have more camels than exist in Arabia. So in the middle of us, like 97% of Australia lives on 3% of the land. Okay, and in the middle, it's big desert and the, the camels have a really good life. And they go around and they pick this little plant and in the, the flowers it has this interesting alkaloid called endoscopine. And they concentrate it in their liver and in their muscle. We know all this now. Some people thought it's a terrible waste we've got all these camels. It's like your organisation. Find a feral animal that, that's not useful, kill it and package it for food. So they developed a whole company about killing camels slaughtering them the right way, rendering the meat and turning it into high quality drug food. And it was full of endoscopine and all of the dogs got cirrhosis. So it's just, it just interesting to think. Now all of this has occurred in Australia over about the last six or seven years, but it shows you how important nutrition is and how <coughs> it's really easy to get things wrong if you don't have variety. And Martin at the break said variety is very important. So I thought I just try a little exercise. So what did you have for breakfast today? I had a smoothie bowl. A what? Smoothie bowl. A smoothie bowl. Yes. Translation please. <laughs> <laughs> a frozen fruit, blended. Okay, that sounds relatively healthy. What did you have yesterday? Granola. What? Granola. And the day before? Okay. Excellent. Because the body is really good if if you have a bit of this today and something different tomorrow and something different the third day, that's what happens in the wild, isn't it? You know, you kill a rabbit, you eat it today, there's nothing available tomorrow, you eat some grasshoppers and then the third day you kill a mouse, like if you're a cat or a fox or something like that. And somehow the body is really good at finding what to do. Be very wary of anybody that tells you, you must use Hill Science Diet and feed nothing else for the whole rest of your life until your cat gets fat when you need to use the weight reduction metabolic high profile diet, until the cat gets renal disease when you immediately flip onto KD. I visited a really important key opinion leader in feline medicine in America. She had seven cats at home and some had IBD and some had renal disease and she used to put five bowls out, all with different letters of the Hill's alphabet and the cats were somehow supposed to work out which bowl to eat from? Okay, this is really actually the photos are just because most of my things are about cats and so I put the photo about dogs. Okay, keep on moving. Three stories from my life. Has anybody heard the graduation, the, the, the graduation thing by Steve Jobs? You need to find that on YouTube and watch it. So I'm going to borrow a little bit from him. So my partner's name's Andrea Harvey. She's one of the authors with Sev Tasker of the BSA VA Manual on Cat.